I would also invite Bharat on stage and Bharat and Paul would have a joint Q&A. So if you have any questions for the Sensora TV presentation as well as this Paul's presentation, you can ask any of the speakers. Questions? Question to Paul. Uh, uh, you have mentioned uh, that uh, we can find the probability of the category of the sender. So, when the sender is unknown, so how this probability is calculated? Well, I, I couldn't how the it. how the probability to find the category of the sender when the sender is unknown is actually calculated? So, so are you asking about, like, for instance, the accuracy of models? How do you calculate? Well, oh, okay. So that's what the model is doing, right? And 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 we you, you can use a lot of different models. Um, a multinomial naive Bayes basically ends up working well. And so we're taking this SMS, we're breaking it into pieces, we're applying a classification model. We don't know who the sender is, so we're classifying it as a bank. Does that make sense? Question. Uh, hi, uh, this question is for Paul. Uh, you said that uh, in case if when customer is transferring money from one account to another, uh, most solutions are not able to do that. How would you approach that problem? Uh, what's that? Uh, how would you approach the problem when customers... Huh. Yeah. Um, so I, I think th then what you're doing is getting down to the level of the actual individual. And so there, which I didn't talk about here, but we're actually classifying what kind of account it is. Is it a savings account? Is it a checking it account? And then like, what is the account number? And because different messages will, will anonymize it, nobody sends your full account number, right? So you might have last four, last two, last first two, last two. There's different ways. So you're understanding what those structures are, and then you're like creating a library, say, for each user of their account numbers, and then you're assigning a probability of whether this particular transaction is associated with this account and this account. Um, and then you might be integrating information like how the balance moves between two messages. So now what you're doing is, is, is modeling things at the level of the actual user. It's like you can classify a message across all users, now you're getting into the level of where you're actually saying, for a given user, you know, call up their accounts, call up their previous balance and subsequent balance to see if the amounts add up. Uh, and that's how you get to that problem. I, what I think, none of these problems in and of themselves is that, is that hard. But layering them into each other so that you can do all of them at, in, a, in a pipeline, I think is where it gets complex. Hello. Uh, let's say one day uh, one bank changed their format entirely. I mean, uh, if you talk about date and balance and all these things. So this solution applicable for that as well? Yeah, it's hard to hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, so, so let's say one day bank changed their format, SMS format entirely. So this solution will be applicable for that as well? You're saying if the bank changes the kind of message it sends? Yeah. Yeah, so that's exactly what you're trying to handle. It's like either a new message from a new type of bank and you want to know very quickly that it's a bank and it's a debit, et cetera, or the same bank changes its template structure and you don't want to have to re-manually classify everything. That's exactly the problem you're trying to solve for. Uh, this question is of Paul. Uh, so these days we see a lot of messages. For example, you, you do one transaction and you mentioned uh, you get an OTP and then for example, due to some reason it got declined. How do you tackle those cases to see okay the transaction went through or there's something uh, declined or something like that? You're saying the OTP is declined? No, you get an OTP and you entered it incorrectly and the finally transaction got declined and you did it again. So there will be multiple messages with same amount and all of that. So there's yes, a lot of yes. noise. How you manage that? Yes. Okay. That's another example of what, like where the complexity comes in. Um, it's not just the problem of the OTP de being declined or like the OTP being sent twice. A lot of types of messages are sent twice. A lot of times you get ding, ding. It's the same exact transaction. The timestamp on the SMS will be different, but the same, same, it's the same message. You don't want to classify that twice as two debit messages. 
So again, you're modeling at the level, you're sort of tracking at the level of the user where you're sort of saying, you're, you're keep, if you're tra classifying a debit message, you, you have rules like uh, time spaces, where it's a probability of it being an independent message given how early, like how, when would the previous message was. Um, a lot of times, it's not the, if it was the exact same message, it would be to, to classify. But uh, if they vary, if they send you two different types of message, one contains balance and one doesn't, right? You still need to, it's not the same uh, message, but it's still uh, basically the same transaction. It's, it's uh, how, how you do that is like, is, is again, layering more of these models onto each other uh, so that you can uh, correctly identify that that's happening. Yeah, uh, Which, my question is around the quality of data you collect from SMSs. Uh, the quality of data you collect from the SMS information. Yeah. So suppose you're trying to build a, a, a balance sheet for a customer. Uh, you know, let's say he gets salary every month. So, but there are child, uh, like issues with network. Sometimes messages won't get delivered. Or the person can have multiple phones he might be using. In those instances, how do you deal with the accuracy of the data you collect and provide a confidence that the, the, that the data you have collected is good to use? Yes. Um, these, are, these are great questions. They really get to like the, the trickiness of the system and why it's so important to have each of the systems be very modular so you can go in and update it. So in the early days when you're first doing it, you remember we, we classified a sender as that six character ID and then in the back of the system you've got the phone number of the user. Yeah, um, and the phone number has a messages associated with it, and you might just be tracking phone number to messages received. But then you want to go in and actually change the user identifier from the phone number to maybe some other unique identifier that has multiple phone numbers associated with it, uh, so that you can then uh, realize that it's the same person. More interestingly, you might actually want to be able to, you may not know that the person has multiple phones, but you want to actually be able to sort of identify that from the messages and sort of saying, wait a second, we're, we're seeing the same pattern. We're seeing like half the messages being received in one phone or the other, but it's the same account. And if you merge those financial data, you're actually seeing like continuity there, or you're seeing family members sharing an account and both of them transacting or something like that. Um, so uh, that, that's, again, a problem of, like, can you go into the system and, like, not mess up all the things around it, but just add that additional level of complexity so that your final output is much more granular and defined? Questions? Uh, let's say you have to train all the SMSs in, in a distributed way. Uh, so you don't have a way to pull SMSs from users and load it into a server and do this complex analysis. Is it possible to run the training as well as the execution in a distributed way in users' respective uh, phones? Run it in the phone? Yeah. Run that training of your model. Yeah. And the uh, insights of the model. Uh, although the training is happening in a distributed way, the learning is collective. Is there any way like that? I think that's a that's an interesting question. I'm not sure I would like want to venture a response because that's not the way I we approached it. But I think it it would depend on like the degree to which you could store models in the phone. So you definitely need to like at some point get outside of the system so you have enough data, train, etc. But maybe you could deploy the model on the phone. I, I'm not familiar enough with Android development, for instance, to be able to like know exactly how that would work. But I, I'm I, I've heard of other use cases where you're trying to basically do entirely localized prediction, where you. But I, I don't know the exact mechanics of how you store the model on the phone. You, usually, it's an sort of like a, an API call. Uh, so, you, uh, as a, uh, while uh, counting the credit rating of the person, do you factor in only the transactional message or service provider message also? So, for example, if I book. Uh, a ticket from clear trip and but i don't make payment using my card uh, someone my friend's card so i will not get the transaction message i'll only get the service provider message so do you factor in that or you only look at just and see that only when a service provider as well as a transaction message comes yeah 
So the goal of the system is to, is to like try to incorporate that information. It's an iterative development process. You're solving the basic problem. You're making as many assumptions as possible to make it easier. And then you're doing more and more. Um, we were getting towards that piece. I, I think um, it's not like fully integrated. But a lot of times this matters for other reasons than like it might not just be that you don't, you're like using someone else's um, payment uh, uh, method, but also it might just be that, like, for some reason, um, it's historical. So once you get on, once your SDK is there, you can make it such that you receive the message. So you don't have to worry so much about missing data of that kind. But for some reason, the phone might have been off, whatever, you don't receive a message. So you have a lot of missing transactions. And let's say you didn't receive, ever receive the bank transaction, but you made a, a, a purchase on Amazon. Right? You can match that purchase against that transaction and sort of say, look, we've got a gap. If we, if we look at balances across these messages, we see the balance going like this, or, or let's say more realistically, it goes like this, right? But we've got, um, we saw transactions, 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 but we have a gap, and the next transaction had a balance lower. We're further down the slope. We don't know where that happened, but now we see an Amazon transaction happen, and we're able to place that into the into the process, right? But now what you're doing is once you've got into the structured data, then you're doing the financial modeling where you can kind of look at someone's account, et cetera. Before you can even do that, you need to know like the transactions on Amazon and the transactions on the bank, and then you can interpolate and like bring them together. But that's the next step in the process. This is purely the extracting the information process. Then once you've extracted it, then you can impute missing data, you can match patterns, you can do all those kind of things because you don't know when it'll be. Um, rather, you want to, like, say, take some segment of uh, transactions before and after that one and see if you can cross-fit it, like, basically identify it as the same transaction amount, uh, that kind of thing. Ah, yes. So, yeah. So th that, uh, this is another example of like where you get a lot of false positives. You're classifying bank messages because Paytm messages end up looking a lot like bank messages. Um, but you, th that's why it's important and at the personal level is to be able to identify the account number information. So here's your account number information. You might have different formats of account, but you're modeling that. And you've, that's what I was saying to the previous question. You have a library of account numbers for a particular user associated with which bank. Right, so it'll be like your HDFC banks and your Citibank accounts and then your Paytms. Um, that's, that's what I was mentioning also about well, not, not getting it right where it's so you, you, that, that's really money in your system when you send it into Paytm or you send it back into your bank. So you need to be able to sort of say when you see a debit transaction, does that debit, where is it going into? Is it going to, into an entity or is it going into one of your accounts? So that's, again, uh, like design of the model where you're saying, this is the problem we're solving. We insert this level of models into the overall system so it runs in parallel or in sequence with all the other models. Uh, this is for Mohan. I want to know, like, as new content is always coming, how do you train your model? Like, we show the uh, ad for a different show. And this will always keep on changing. Like next, they will show some clip from the next week's show. And the next week again, they will show some clip from the next, the following week. So how do you keep on training your, updating your model? The content is always changing. Okay, so uh, let me just understand your question. So you're, you're saying the... Uh, the, the clips will keep getting updated and are you asking how we can how we monetize that or how we keep updating the model yeah <clears throat> so we don't have a model right so it's a unsupervised system if that answers then <laughs> but uh, so it, it, the way we extract stuff is which is exactly why uh, this is a case of a system that that requires uh, an unsupervised approach because the data is changing very dynamically. You'll always have a new kind of thing and and uh, training for something is going to uh, take up more time. 
uh, but unsupervised methods work out better because there are statistical uh, patterns that are there that we kind of make use of to uh, bubble up. So, yeah. But the models are used to make the system more efficient. So, to auto-classify a, a clip as an ad versus a house promotion, you can use models that are trained from already observed data. Uh, if once tagged, you can, uh, a clip that is already tagged once, you can use that to put it into a database and learn some features. So if something related to this ad comes up later on, you're able to classify it faster. Uh, but largely, it is an unsupervised system. I think he's waiting for a long time there. <laughs> Hello. Uh, question for Bharat. So, uh, do you plan to, you know, open this data for public anytime in future? Open the setup as in? Uh, the data, data part as in, you know, just like, you know, uh, for Google Maps, you know, Google did. And yeah. So, adbreaks.in is, is an open system. We give you high level analytics to kind of observe whatever patterns that are there. Okay. Um, some parts of it are copyright protected. For example, the clips that we observe mm -hmm. are actually extracted from a broadcasted feed, right? Okay. So they're mostly for private consumption. Uh, okay. That's there. High level statistics, absolutely we want to make it available uh, for public. But you're saying you want a full fire hose of data. No, something, uh, something more for developers, you know, that, you know, maybe because you've got a nice set of data, probably I don't know if anyone else has it. And if you could, you know, open it for developers, who, you know, we can actually consider that. So, or even if you want to do an internship or something like that, or <laughs> join us on board, there's a lot of data we can. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, uh, just wanted a little bit more about the monetization model. More importantly, are you targeting the end customer themselves? Okay, I think uh, at least I couldn't catch. Like for example, I, as a customer, I'm right. watching, I'm using this. What's what's in it for me? Like, I mean, I, I just uh, logged into your site. It's probably good for the broadcaster or the uh, service providers. But what is in it for the end customer? Because you know, people move. The moment some ad comes, I switch to another channel. I know that I got bored. Right. But what is in it for me and... Uh, how can you get it personalized for the user themselves, the the people who watch? Yep. Uh, ads, yeah. So uh, it will trickle down. Ultimately, causing the experience for the end consumer will be much better. And I'll explain how it will happen. The reason why you see an ad 200 times is because they don't know who's seen it, right? So there's this famous thing in uh, television advertising which says. 50% of all TV ad spend is wasted, but you don't know which 50% it is, right? And there's also a lot of psychological research in, in advertising which says that a brand needs to be present probably five times, but be, and until then, the recall is not there. But after five times, it has a diminishing effect of, of uh, diminishing returns and has a negative brand recall because you just hate it. You're like, why am I seeing this again, right? And the other thing you should notice is the first time you've seen an ad, you've always liked it because there's curiosity and there's immense amount of creativity that goes into creating uh, an ad. So creating a feedback system actually makes it more efficient, right? Because advertisers will take up fewer spots because they know they've had these five impressions, they don't want to sell more. So slowly you will see that the ad breaks will start shrinking if they know who's watching it. And better ads will be able to reach people who can uh, kind of benefit from that. Now, the, the truth of the industry is you need ads to survive because you're not going to bear the cost of content, right? So, it's, uh, content is expensive. So, the only way this can scale is, is through advertising. And good products also need to come in front of uh, consumers. So, better data insights helps the entire industry. And ultimately, it's going to, it's like GST is going to help the consumer, right? But but it, it's meant for the industry, like streamlines the whole process. So that is one perspective. The other is, is what we are also creating is, is an X-ray kind of experience for, uh, for television, where you can search better. So in fact, we are building systems where you can use voice and tell 
like take me to an english movie that is not in an ad break now right uh, so in general it it helps the experience there or you can set an alert and say uh, like uh, come back to this channel when the ad break is over right so these are all interesting experiences even for uh, consumers we want to be careful about how we do this because it's ads are the bread and butter of the in fact we had a we had tested this for some time and then we were like no it's not the way to go uh, and we removed it so questions hi i have a question for paul uh so looking at the content i see it is kind of st uh, syntactically correct so have you tried exploring anything on the uh, syntactical parsing of nlp like part of speech or dependency parse tree like one example that you had account 1 2 3 is debited amount this much uh is debited is the predicate and you have subject and object so have you tried leveraging that information uh, somewhere or have you explored that Yeah. Yeah, uh so there's definitely aspects of this that are you could I think leverage NLP methods. I think there's some entity extraction. I think um that uh that a lot of times the way I've seen for instance um entity extraction done is sort of like a named rec entity recognition type thing is is where it's like you're looking for any particular named entity it's not necessarily that you're you're looking for this particular one over multiple iterations where it's variable but not in a meaningful way so like everyone's account number but in sense of um taking an approach where you say um you're looking at part of speech and like you said uh you have your your your, your verb debited etc we 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 played a little bit but it was it it wasn't as generalizable to a lot of the other problems so like fitting that type of model was theoretically possible into the system and that's the point was like you can leverage different approaches within the same system like any model at any different level can be its own and use its data in its own way it doesn't need to like use the same data as the previous model but for in terms of just writing speed of a data scientist doing the same thing multiple times is easier than to like context switch and sort of say now i need to understand a little bit what's happening with the nlp i think there's there's some good potential to do even more than what we when we tried out um and that's why i kind of like encourage like oh there's this is how you can kind of get a get a data set because then i would love to sort of see different methods applied um i also think that like certain certain unsupervised methods could be really interesting um because there's in in a, in a sense of clustering kind of a, a way I think there are some some problems there but anyway I think there's definitely more that could be done and that's what I was trying to say is that like a lot of times people see this and they're like I have just heard a lot of people say it's it's commodified right it's a solved problem but it's just like the tiny bit at the top is is solved like there's all and doing it efficiently effectively across all the different use cases that were were called out in questions I think it's where it gets interesting um so but I think this type of NLP is is definitely a candidate for further exploration. Okay, thank you. Questions? Okay, I don't see any more questions. Thank you Paul, thank you Bharat. It was a very thank great you. presentation.